So welcome, Sonia. It's nice to have you on this side of the camera as opposed to on the other side where you are for startup school. And yeah, we were both Mark and I were really impressed with what you were doing and what you'd achieved. And so if you could just give us a bit of background about your business and Okay. All right. So you already know my name, Sonia Moore, and uh, I'm the founder of More Options Skills Development Training. And so the name was born out of my surname. I woke up one morning and the name came to me, More Options. So I thought, that's it. <laughs> it has to be because it'll show all the different elements of me and all the different sides and all the things that I can do. Um, it's not just going to be one thing. So it will be lots of different things. So hence the name. All right. So I develop and run uh, programs, training programs around helping and supporting people to build um, healthy re resilience and well-being. And um, I guess in terms of my background, I'm a, I'm a trained counsellor with experience of over 25 years or more. And I'm also a tutor. So I've got both those skills that sort of lends itself to the learning and training. Um, so, uh, you know, as well as my counselling, uh, where I've counselled in the voluntary sector and in also the, um, the public sector and the private sector for a number of years. Um, I've also taught in um, centres of adult education and further education colleges. Um, and so... I guess that I believe that this has influenced my business as, as a tutor, as a trainer um, in developing the courses that I've run. And so these courses are ranging from counselling skills, which is really part of me because as a counsellor, it's nice to be able to teach something that I know. Um, uh, I, I've also developed programmes around bereavement and loss. Uh, around confidence building, um, self-awareness, and um, stress managing stress. Um, yeah, so that's really about me. And uh, my business, I started my business in um, February of 2010. So it's just gone 10 years now, my math serves me right. Um, so it's been on and off. It hasn't always been steady. Um, it's been ups and downs and peaks and troughs, but I guess that's the way that life works. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the fact that your name, obviously, more, Sonia Moore, and more options gives you so much flexibility because that's one of the things I discovered about my own business, which is changing names, is that oftentimes people immediately think about a business name which they identify with exactly what they're doing right so you could have been more counseling or more bereavement services or, or whatever it happens to be but that often can prove to be really limiting as you say that yeah. that coming up with a name that gives you that flexibility to be able to shift and change as you want to and doesn't require a complete overhaul of whatever your business name is, is so important in the early days because we can get tremendously attached to a name, can't we? Tremendously attached to a business name and think this is it. And then what we realize, this is my own story, <laughs> down Absolutely. the line is that yeah. it, it takes you to a cul-de-sac and you can't, you, you've got nowhere to go. And then you have to consider what you're going to do next. Are you going to be stuck in this cul-de-sac where you might not be very happy? Or are you going to allow yourself the freedom to be able to explore some of the other aspects of business, of business that may be more of interest to you? So I remember during startup school, one of the things that, and it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, seemed to be around the bereavement counseling. This seemed to be something that you were potentially a, a new direction. Is that right? Or um, Actually, um, the bereavement course, Living Through Loss, I'd written it about two years ago. Um, and as I explained in the beginning of the course, um, what influenced me is the loss that I'd experienced in my own family uh, within the last seven years. I've had seven significant loss. And um, I, this course was written in the midst of all that. 
and I didn't have the courage to actually deliver it. I didn't think I was in that place because a lot of the information that I was presenting would resonate with my own feelings. And I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted to get to a time where I felt that I was ready. And so it had laid dormant and um, a college that I was actually teaching at, um, I was self-employed at this college. So they asked me actually to, to, to deliver a course around that subject area. And I decided to do it. And I was just amazed at the impression it had on the learners. I had a group of 16 learners and um, I felt that it was right. It felt good. It felt right. And it, it touched so many people and it reached. Because when we think about loss, we don't just think about um, the physical loss of death. We think about our symbolic losses. We think about, you know, the loss of our independence, the loss of our jobs. The, the, the loss of our freedom, uh, the loss of our health. There are so many elements. So everyone within that group of, I think there was 18 people, uh, it connected with them. Um, you know, people losing their jobs was a major factor. Uh, people losing their, uh, their health, you know, had someone who lost his sight. And he realized how debilitating that was for him. And it literally was like losing a loved one. The feeling of bereavement and bereft is, is so, was so strong within him that, you know. Um, so this was the course that I started off with the new year. I started thinking about, <laughs> here we are in a pandemic. And there's been so many loss of lives and, you know, the loss of relationships, people being together. There were just so many elements. And I, I decided, you know what, maybe now is the time to resurrect this course, um, if you pardon the pun. Um, and uh, I started to market it. And um, it, marketing isn't my forte, but I thought, you know, what, I need to start getting, in, getting it out there. And I put it on one of the voluntary sectors website, you know, which is a free website for voluntary uh, people to kind of engage in. And there was a lot of responses to, yes, we'd like to do this course. And I set the date to start January. Um, but then I was mindful that there's a pandemic and it's, we were getting the, the, the inkling that it was going to get to the UK. And by February, it was here in the UK. And I'd actually set the date for March and that I was going to deliver this course. I'd got the center booked and everything. But then people started to drop off because they said, we're not very comfortable with Zoom um, going on the internet. It's not something that we can do. It was a new ball game for me also. I must admit, I, I was fearful of the process. Um, but I, I decided that I needed to do this. Um, and so I continued then to start um, posting on Facebook. Uh, my daughter, who's very akin with this type of um, process, she said, get yourself out there, you know, start doing some videos, um, writing some blogs, just get yourself out there. Let people know that you're available to do this work because it's so valuable and it's valid and it's timely. And that's where I decided to really... <laughs> reinvent myself in terms of my energies and um, I was going out in the spring doing videos <laughs> and uh, going for walks and then posting it and um, people were responding but they were more responding to the scenery <laughs> rather than there's a course starting that was the initial feeling but eventually um, I had a few sign up and then it started to grow and then I delivered the course in June. And the 8th of June, I started my first Zoom um, on uh, living through loss. But prior to that, there was a lot of work. I was absolutely exhausted. Um, but there was a passion within me in terms of wanting to get this out there and, and, and make people know about it and, and just allow them the um, flexibility to, to hear something just, just as a starter you know, listen, um, it might be useful to you. It's not just about death. It's also about <laughs> where we are at this present moment. Um, so, yes, um, the bereavement course was the one that was my flagship for 2020. Um, and um, 
one of the uh, interesting things for me was um, in sending out my information on the voluntary sector um, website, um, somebody contacted me and it was, it was a, a minister, a reverend. <clears throat> and I thought that was interesting. And her email was, could you send me some details about this course? Um, I'd like to know a bit more. So I actually thought it was for her, um, this reverend. And she came back and said, I have some people within my congregation who might be interested. And I was really surprised and interested and, and, and excited by this. Um, and from that, um, actually, she paid for a couple of people from her congregation who were willing to do the course. So I had a range of people on this first cohort of the Living Through Loss. So as I said, um, it's kind of, it's helped a lot of people and it's helped, it's helped me. But as I said, I had to take a step back where it wasn't about me. It was about working with all these wonderful people who just wanted to share their experiencing of their broken relationship, their loss of health, uh, their loss of freedom, and indeed their loss of their loved ones. And so through that journey, we were able to explore all those different areas and, um, uh, six weeks later, we came to an end, but then we met up again in, in um, sort of four weeks time, four weeks later, to kind of just uh, reflect, the reflective session. And um, I set up a Facebook group for them and they were able to go online and everybody's able to tap in and, and support each other. So that was the success for me for this year. Amazing. Well, God, you couldn't have thought of anything more topical, could you? <laughs> I mean, honestly, who would have thought when you first, you know, considered going forward with this in January that we would be where we are now? Um, Absolutely. Clearly, so much of business is about timing, isn't it? It's just, and not just timing in in society of when society is ready for something but often when we're ready for it um we've all had those feelings sometimes where it can be really either scary to put something out there because you're worried about what people might think or alternatively yeah. you you have so much feeling deep feeling about it yourself that it also is about whether you have the resilience within yourself to be able to deliver this um when again going back to when I when I first did um, a version of startup school with someone else a number of years ago, one of the things I found is I'm not a natural trainer in in um, in a real world sense. I I found it overwhelming when confronted with people my own age who were struggling um, to be in a room with them for we, we used to do four hour sessions and. And I found it really quite exhausting and emotionally draining. Um, but delivering the same kind of material, but di but different over um, Zoom and over video, I actually found fun and less um, emotionally draining, even though it was still very exhausting. Um, Absolutely. Sometimes as well, it's about the delivery format. And you said initially you'd considered doing it in a physical place. Then because of the pandemic, you couldn't. Then the thought was, can I move this across to Zoom? Is this going to work? Are people yes. going to engage with this? Yes. Your own fears around that maybe about whether that was something that you were comfortable with and then and then deciding to move forward with that. So I think such a great story about um, pivot, about the pivot as well that you had to, you had to make in order to, to do what you wanted to do. But also, I, I love the story of your daughter encouraging you to go for it and with social media, because you are, you know, what I've seen is that you're very natural with all of this sort of stuff. And, and that even though you may experience some fear around it, it's it's clearly something that you're good at. So um, have you had so. this experience that you, you have become more comfortable with it? And um, do you see that? Do you think you just lucked out with Facebook in terms of the fact that it was a great place for you to find those early customers or was there more considered, uh, was it a more considered approach? 
Okay, when I initially started, I'll be honest with you, um, it was very difficult. I started in, in 2010 and I started off by applying for funding because my idea was around if I could get some funding, then maybe I could offer my courses on a, a subsidised basis because I knew unemployment rate was pretty high at the time. So I had to consider those things, um, thinking about the climate. Did people have money to pay for courses? Um, um, was there any money available to subsidise these? And so I um, had a conversation with somebody at the Voluntary um, Services Council who actually directed me to apply and um, to a funding body. And I applied to a few. And one of them was the Unlimited. Uh, she, uh, she encouraged me um, to apply to Unlimited. And I must admit, I did apply to Unlimited, but it was like a brutal experience because <laughs> I think I've mentioned this to you, Susan. It was, um, I, I, the interview stages was quite, uh, there were two inter interview, two or three different interviews. And they literally tore my idea apart. I felt battered. I felt absolutely no way am I going to get this. I've just wasted all my time. But I still believe, and I think it's important to believe in what you're wanting to do. If you don't have that self-belief, it's not going to happen. And they pick that up very easily too. So they must have seen that this passion, no matter how they battered me in terms of questions and tore away and took apart my ideas, uh, they knew that uh, there's something here, that she really wants to do this. That must have come, apart, come across because when I got the phone call, um, I thought it was a wrong number because the person that called me wasn't the person who interviewed me. It was somebody else. And he just said, we've just had a meeting and we've come to a decision regarding your bid, your application. And there was a long pause. <laughs> We're delighted to tell you that you've been successful. OK, it wasn't a huge amount, but you know what? It was enough. It was enough to propel and to start the idea of offering subsidized courses courses at sub subsidized prices. So the money which I received, I was able to pay for the hire of the room. So that didn't have to come out my pocket. Um, the equipment that I needed, I was able to purchase that. And then um, the resources. Um, so all I asked from the learners was a registration fee and that was to enable them to stay on the course. So that, um, that, that was really good. But the beauty of it being is that there was a series of courses that I'd got, which was the um, the counselling. The at that point I hadn't got the bereavement and loss, so I got the counselling skills. I got uh, assertiveness, confidence building, um, stress management, uh, mental health, those kind of courses. So the way it would work after sort of six weeks doing one then they would sign up for the next one. So then there'd be another fee, registration fee, or I would, you know, ask them to pay more. And to the end, they'd probably, most people that did these courses, they did all four or five. So I'd have got different groups and it went on for a good sort of three years. So that was a learning experience for me. So that was my initial startup. And I can say it was successful. Um, but as time has changed and has gone by, then um, th there is now a different climate um, in that, uh, yeah, people haven't got money. So we look at organizations. I tend to look at organizations that can um, pay for my expertise in terms of coming in and delivering. And so for the last uh, five years, I believe that's where I was at. Um, but then redundancy has kind of um, kicked in. But um, I'm now really still wanting to push the courses individually and, and, and know that they will be successful. But it's um, trying to channel my energies into all these different areas of social media now. So um, uh, I, I, I did struggle with social media and thinking about, well, where are my customers? How do I find them? I keep putting things out and lots of people are liking um, but my daughter suggested it's when they engage with you, wait for the engagement. So um, I then found out that people will be asking questions. And so um, 
what I found is um, a group. I found a group in terms of the bereavement course. It's a it's a, it's a it's a women business group, and I noticed a advert. It was just a post that said, "What is the worst thing that you've been told on losing someone?" And as I read through, I could see there were over four or five hundred people that had given their stories about the things that people said to them, such as a, oh, you'll get over it. Oh, move on. You know, it's um, everybody, everybody will die someday or you will lose someone someday or time will heal. There were things that people say they don't realize how how. <laughs> how heartbreaking it can be, you know, it's such a sensitive time. You've got to kind of be in the right frame of mind and to be empathetic in your understanding of what that person's going through. And it, it's it's a skill that we, not all of us have. So when people say something, it's not they're saying it out to be mean. It's, it's their way of saying, well, I don't know what else to say. So maybe if I say this, that will help. But what I found was lots of unhelpful things. And so I was able to then engage with some of these comments. And that's how I managed to get some customers by actually engaging, not selling. I'm not pushy. So people will never see that I'm selling something. I, I like, I'm a person-centered counselor. So therefore, um, the, the, the people are at the forefront always. Their feelings, their beliefs, their experiences are always at the forefront of my mind. And so um, I have to engage and connect. There has to be some kind of connection. And you kind of um, then move to the point where you might get the question, how, how comes you seem to know these things or how comes you are able to guide me in this way it sounds as if you too have experienced and I would say yes I too have experienced and um, eventually I would then share one of my blogs because I, I do blogs just to get out there it's it's free you just write a blog and then if they like it and it fits in with their theme they'll put it out so I might share a blog and then they might say, oh, it sounds like you are doing something else from your blog. You're, you're actually delivering courses. Is this something that, is there anything relevant at this moment? So the questions will come. So I gently guide people in. So I never do. It's not about hard sell. I don't, it doesn't work with me and it doesn't fit with my, my personality in terms of, so I feel uncomfortable with hard selling. So it's... See, what you said about... Um... This is the way when people ask, how do you use things like Facebook groups? How do you try and get across what you're doing in on social media? I think so much of it comes down to what value can you add, right? What what are you what is the value that you're adding to the conversation? So Absolutely. if, for instance, there's 400 comments and and there's feedback that you're providing and you're giving your own experience and sharing, then that's building trust. That's mm -hmm. showing people that there's some empathy there. There's somebody that knows what they're going through. Um, you're giving back, you're not asking. And all of these things contribute ultimately to people believing that potentially you might be able to help solve their problem. And I think so much of this is about you know, what you can give, I'm reading a book about this at the moment, which is about enrichment and value and what you can give in terms of just supporting and helping others before you even begin to think about how that might benefit yourself. Because if you can help others, then the chances are that at some point in time, it's my great belief that that the help will come back to you and the, and the value will come back to you as well. But first it's about the value that you can give to others. And I think in, in groups, especially the more you can show that you can add value, that you have something to say that, that people want to hear and that potentially could save them time or money or make them feel better. The likelier it is that down the line, you're going to be able to, um, as you say, slowly be able to attract them to what it is that you're doing. And I think that's a, it's a great way to use social media 
and it doesn't cost anything except for your time. Um, mm -hmm. And also, of course, those 400 comments, what amazing market research that is. <laughs> yeah. Through through that, you're able to extract so much information about, the, as you say, the different types of loss, how people are uh, feel when somebody um, responds to them in a way that doesn't support them or makes them feel bad, and and some of the techniques that you use potentially to combat that, so so that people go away feeling feeling encouraged. I know that I have friends that suffer from depression and it's one of the things that they comment on as well, that, mm -hmm. you know, when they say that they're feeling depressed, it's people just associate that with sadness and they just say mm -hmm. things like, Oh, cheer up, you yeah. know, cheer up. Look at, look at the sun. It's shining outside. <laughs> it's yeah. say, it's just so not what you want to hear when you're, yeah. when you're clinically yeah. depressed. So I think it's a really good, um, it's a really good, lesson and a, and, a, and a great strategy when you're looking for customers. Have you ever paid for any form of advertising or anything? Um, yes, um, because the same voluntary sector that I used to advertise, they used to give you free advertisement, but it depends on how much your courses are costing. For example, if you're charging £100 for um, a course per person, then their fee will be £100. Um, if you're charging £200, then your fee will be 200 etc. And so it goes on. But if you're doing anything that's kind of um, under £15, it's free adverts. So there is a danger to undersell yourself just to get customers. But I guess it's a way that you can actually start, um, you know, um, yeah. putting something out there. But uh, in, uh, what I did in the early days is I, I used to use the free newspapers. You know, there's a lot of free free newspapers out there. And so I'd contact someone and just uh, they'd ask me to send them um, a news feed or something. And then they, they would actually put something in. So we have local papers that will do that hmm. freely. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I've used mainly free adverts, but I, yes, I have paid for adverts and um, that has engaged people uh, because there are people who just want freebies. <laughs> there were people on my courses that said um, their, their, their catchphrase was, is it free? And everybody's looking for something free. But um, <clears throat> I think my time isn't free because I put a lot of work into these. And then, you know, when you're looking at, centers you've got to pay for the centers the higher centers so that's another bonus in terms of doing things online i have saved all that money in the booking fee six weeks of booking a center if i was to take that away from the fee that i charge my courses i, I would end up with nothing so online that you're just paying for your um your space your zoom uh, whatever media you're using um and as you say facebook and those places are free to advertise things but it's reaching the right audience because lots of people will see and like, but not engage. Did you, did you just kind of feel that you lucked out with that women in business group or was it, um, did you, did you originally reach out to, to multiple groups? Um, um I, yeah. On that one. Yes. Um, Initially, I was kind of going into lots of different groups, but I didn't understand that actually you need to understand the rules of groups and actually think about what you're posting. So <laughs> you can't just post any and anything. So I then became quite selective. It was very early that I realized that actually, no, you can't put it in there because uh, it's not really, it's against their rule. You've got to understand the group, the, gr the rule of the group. And so in this group, which I joined, um, uh, I was watching the posts, the type of posts that were coming in. And it was when I saw this one that, what's the worst thing that's ever been said to you when you've lost someone? And that was where it opened a floodgate. So I thought, oh, this one looks interesting. So I started to engage in that. Um, but I, I also realized that um, I need to be putting um, posts out um, so that people can see these posts and, and start to get to know me. Um, because uh, another thing that my daughter said, they don't know you, so you need to put yourself out there so they can get to know you. Um, 
So this this was this is really what I'm working on. And you know, um, the start of school has taught me so much. You know, it was just an absolute honor and pleasure to be part of it because uh, it really opened up my eyes. Um, I, I was asked the question, um, who are your customers? And I had to actually think about that. Who, who, who are my customers? What's my ideal customer? And I started off by answering, well, I could tell you who is not my <laughs> ideal customer. Um, I think it was Mark in the start of school that asked me the question. It made me think, and that's a good thing, you know, able to think, who are my ideal customers? So, for example, the, um, the counselling skills course. So you get a range of people who say, I want to be a counsellor. So uh, my answer to them in doing this course, it's not going to make you a counsellor. What it will do, it will give you all the initial skills and understanding um, that, you know, you need as a counsellor. And it's not just working as a counsellor. Counselling skills are interpersonal skills. So it can influence any walks of your life. You know, you're learning to listen. You're learning empathetic skills. You're, you're learning how to be non-judgmental and more accepting of each other. Um, so my ideal customer is someone who was perhaps looking to do this course. Yeah, um, what are you wanting to know about yourself and what, 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 what skills are you wanting to develop? And these are the skills that we'll be learning. Could these skills benefit you in, in whatever walks of life that you're on or in your journey? And the answer was always yes. So these people would be anyone who just wanted some understanding um, of, you know, how to be a better listener, uh, a helper, an enabler, uh, you know, just to influence their own um, self and their own lives. Um, but also it might be someone who is in a helping role and don't have the skills to be able to utilize it um, successfully. And so they would do this course to develop all these type of skills, you know, in terms of listening, active and attentively listening and understanding things from other people's point of view, because we tend to listen to things from our point of view. And when you are an effective listener, you're able to hear both sides of the coin, um, listening to experiences, behaviors, emotions, feelings, um, Who's my ideal customer in um, the bereavement course? Um, to be honest with you, a, a lot of people who wanted to do the course had been recently bereaved and through this experience of the pandemic. And so everything was still raw for them. And I would suggest maybe the time wasn't right. Um, so if they were going to join a group and they are still in this stages of shock, of disbelief, um, or of anger, because it was so new and so raw, it probably wasn't, and, and doing it by Zoom probably wouldn't be the right forum for them. So I would discourage someone who said, I'm in this process of grief, I can't cope, and I, I don't know what to do. And so the course would have been filled about them. They, I think they more needed a one-to-one -one rather than a group. And, and also the physical distance of being online where you're not able to even touch their, hold their hands or a hand on the shoulder to show some empathy. Um, so those things had to be taken into consideration. So yeah, uh, who's my ideal customer in, um, in, in that type of environment? Uh, sorry, in that type of course, I would suggest then someone who's experienced some degree of loss and they're stuck they've reached a point of stuck and they're wanting to process the loss and work through it. And I found that work best in the group that I've currently, um, I've recently run. It was people whose experiences was, I lost my mother last year and I still can't come to terms with the loss. And I'm still experiencing this sense of another person. I lost my sight um, four years ago. Um, and this is what I'm feeling now and I want to work through this or someone, um, you know, anticipatory grief. My father is dying and I don't know what to do in terms of supporting him or supporting my family or indeed myself. So in terms of anticipatory grief, 
the course would offer lots of solutions and lots of suggestions in terms of how to work through that. So in terms of finding an ideal customer, I needed to think about the nature of the course and what it was, how effective it would be for that person. Yeah, absolutely. And also the importance of understanding who is not your customer, right? Absolutely. Yes. So, so. It's so important when people say my customer is potentially anyone, you know, you could easily have said anyone who suffered any type of bereavement is my customer, right? Easy to say that. Yes. You know, but actually digging down and saying, well, actually, no, a person who suffered a recent bereavement is not my customer. A person Absolutely. who suffered a bereavement a year ago potentially is my customer. A person who suffered even, you know, uh, the loss of a pet or something that or, you know, something that had deep meaning for them is yes. potentially my customer. So understanding who is not your customer versus who is your customer is so yes. important because again, you can go down the rabbit hole of identifying this very broad group of people and then mm -hmm. deciding and wasting huge amounts of time speaking to people yes. who either, as you said before, want something for nothing and you're not able to provide that because you know, you're know you not funded or alternatively are potentially people who are gonna demand so much attention that they're gonna detract from the other people who need support and you're not yeah. going to be able to give everyone the time and, um, you know, support that they need. So I think that's also very, very important. One thing I should just add, because we're going to come to a close soon on this, is that I applied to Unlimited four times and I only recently got accepted. So. <laughs> well done. Well done. That's I was I felt, amazed. Yeah. Fantastic. Felt, well done. I felt enormously validated in that process because knowing how hard it is yes accepted is was something really quite significant for me it certainly <laughs> and to be recognized um but i think you're right a lot of what this is about just generally is just about having that passion and people seeing that passion and being able to uh and getting drawn to that just getting drawn to that passion so yeah absolutely I totally yes. empathize with your interview story <laughs> like, oh god it they didn't tear me apart but they work yeah they work they were quite fierce but also just uh, you know I do think I think it's interesting that because it maybe was originally where you came from that your original when you first very first started your original thought was I want to do this in a particular way and that means I need to be funded and yes. that means that potentially, like startup school, our customers are organizations, local authorities, charities, whatever, who can provide us with um, the opportunity to deliver this for free mm -hmm. to people. Mm -hmm. And then realizing that actually over the course of the 10 years that you've been doing this and your, the, and your circumstances that, mm -hmm. you know, delivering with people directly to customers where they pay is mm -hmm. possible. It's a different mm -hmm. strategy. It requires a different approach. Obviously, there's a different set of marketing. You probably didn't realize when you originally set out to go to the to people like Unlimited and other organizations because maybe that was your background. But that is, of course, a completely different kind of marketing activity of mm -hmm. going to different types of customers who you have to sit in front of an interview panel to be able to, to get <laughs> to get your money, right? It versus going on Facebook groups and, and everything. So really, you know, it, it is all about identifying who is your, who is your ideal customers. And in that respect, back then it was obviously organizations. Now it could be direct to beneficiaries. It really, it really just, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's the same thing, but, but looking at it in, in, in different ways. So I think that when you say I'm not very good at this, clearly you spent a lifetime being very good at being able to, um, you know, to generate funding and, and to get um, grants and things and to be able to deliver in one way. This is just a, it's just a different way. It's not mm -hmm. you know, different set of techniques, but. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, it was important to find who my customers were, 
what was my ideal candidate. I did start off by saying anyone and everyone, and I realized that wasn't the right answer because in terms of the answer I've given you regarding identifying um, who these are, it was through the startup school that I had to sit down and think about that, that question that had never been raised before. And it's so important that you do understand who your customers are, otherwise you're chasing your tail. Yeah, completely. And I think that is such a great way to end, Sonia. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. That's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Good luck with all all of the work you do because it's it's really important. And I can see I can see the the passion that you feel about it. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your feedback. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Time to speak to me. That's been absolutely brilliant. Thank and you. Good luck with all, all of the work you do because it, it's it's really important. And I can see I can see the, Thank you. the passion that you feel about it. So Thank you so much. I really appreciate your feedback and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you.